The next speaker is Claire Lopez, Vice President for Research and Analysis at the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. Claire is a strategic policy and intelligence expert with a focus on Middle East, national defense, weapons of mass destruction, and counterterrorism issues. Specific areas of expertise include Islam and Iran. She is a former operations officer with the CIA, serving domestically and abroad for 20 years in a variety of assignments and acquiring extensive expertise in counterintelligence, counter narcotics, and counter proliferation issues with a career regional focus on the former Soviet Union, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Balkans. A big welcome to you, Claire. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. I'm sorry that I don't speak Danish, but I know that so many of you understand English, so thank you for that. And um, I very much appreciate the invitation to be with you today, to be among such an assembly of freedom-loving people. It's an honor for me and it's a privilege. Thank you. I think if we're going to be on these themes that we are covering today, we have to start first with an understanding of who we are. In other words, what do we of Western civilization hold dear? What are our first things principles, as we call them in the United States? Those first thing principles meaning what we hold so dear that we will fight and die to defend them. Well, I think that perhaps values, diversity, pluralism, don't quite cut it. Especially when the values being welcomed are hostile to our own in the first place. Here's what we would list, and I think you would probably agree with me, but as an American and someone of Western civilization just as you are, I think we would put first individual liberty the freedom of speech, the freedom of belief, the freedom of assembly, government by consent of the governed, under rule of man-made law, and then equality of all before that law. Now the enemy that we face most directly today, the forces of Islamic Jihad and Sharia, they call themselves the Islamic movement. They know exactly what they believe. And it is none of these things that I just listed. Under Islamic law, under Sharia, for example, Muslim and non-Muslim are never equal legally before Sharia, before Islamic law. The world is divided into two, the Dar al-Islam, and that is the place where Sharia rules, it is the law, and the Dar al-Harb, meaning the place of war, the house of enemies, that's us. It is a divine commandment for the forces of Islamic Jihad to conquer the first, uh, to conquer, I should say, the Dar al-Harb, and to subjugate it entirely to the Dar al-Islam. That is what every single Muslim is obligated to do. Whether they do or not is up to the individual, and people are individuals. But that is the law. That is what they are obligated to do. Men and women are never, ever equal under Islamic law. I have a problem with that. And then, for one who is either born Muslim or who converts to Islam, there's no getting out of it without a death penalty. Apostasy, or leaving Islam, is a capital crime. It is punishable by death 
under Islamic law. Blasphemy is a punishable crime under Islamic law. Slander, which has a very specific meaning in American law to have slander or libel, you have to have something, number one, that is not true. Number two, it has to be intended maliciously. And number three, it has to actually cause harm. That's our law. I think it is probably similar to yours. But under Islam, under Sharia, slander is whatever would offend a Muslim quote unquote from Islamic law. Quite subjective, you see. There is no free speech under Sharia. Then there are the barbarous punishments like amputation, beheading, flogging, execution for adulterers and apostates and homosexuals. All of that is legal under Sharia. Underage child marriages, forced underage child marriages are common. Why? Because Muslims believe that Muhammad did it. They believe from his biography, from the hadith, that is the sayings attributed to Muhammad, that he married a six-year-old. Oh, but he, he, he waited until she was nine to, to consummate the marriage, so um, I guess we give him that. Polygamy is legal under Islamic law, uh, but that is uh, only for the men. We uh, women don't get any such thing. We, we're stuck with whatever we get. Uh, men are also allowed under Islamic law to have as many sex slaves as they would like. In case four wives is not enough, you know, um, they may have uh, as many uh, sex slaves as they're able to capture on the field of battle. Or the, or, or the streets of Rotterdam or, or uh, Birmingham, as, as it were. Um, as you probably know, female genital mutilation is also either obligatory or condoned or approved under Islamic law, depending on which school of jurisprudence you might be talking about. But in any case, it's perfectly all right. You may have heard in the United States now, we have our very first case of FGM, as we call it, uh, being prosecuted right now uh, out of the state of Michigan. A doctor was found to be practicing this barbarous atrocity on little girls. Two clinic owners, a husband and a wife, are now under arrest as well. And I think I heard uh, recently that they have just arrested uh, two more mothers. It is the mothers who bring their little girls to be mutilated, if you can imagine this. I'm a mother. I cannot imagine this, but that's what they do. So all of those things, I think, make it very clear that what we face is completely and totally antithetical to what we believe and to what we hold dear. I'm going to quote Pamela Geller. She's a terrible bigot and a racist and an Islamophobe, but I kind of like her. She said very recently, or I guess actually she wrote this in Commentary Magazine, <clears throat> the, the uh, current issue just coming out this summer, she wrote, Free speech is the soul of our nation and the foundation of all our other freedoms. If we can't speak out against injustice and evil, those forces will prevail. Freedom of speech is the foundation of a free society. Without it, a tyrant can wreak havoc unopposed while his opponents are silent. We of the Western world, of Western civilization, and the principles we hold dear must not ever allow that to happen. The Islamic State is losing the battle for Raqqa and Mosul right now, but it's winning the war. Or maybe I should say it's not exactly just only the Islamic State 
They change their name every other week anyway. Who knows what it will be next week? The point is, they are the leading edge, the sword of the Islamic movement, the global Islamic movement. That's the term, by the way, that the Muslim Brotherhood uses, Islamic movement. So I think we should too. And the Muslim Brotherhood, a jihadist organization just like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and Taliban and Hamas and Hezbollah and all of the others, fight to impose Islamic law, Sharia, on all the world under a global caliphate. I was on a TV show just before I came here. I, um, I arrived in Copenhagen on Thursday. Well, I left on Thursday. I arrived here on Friday. And um, had been on a TV show really just before I went to the airport. And it was a panel program um, locally broadcast in my home state of Virginia. And um, we, were, we were talking about some of these subjects related to the Middle East on, on, the, pa on the panel. And um, there was a lot of discussion about uh, the fight against terrorism. We're fighting terrorism. We have to defeat terrorism. And I said, wait a minute. We're not fighting terrorism. We fight to live free of Islamic law. We of the West. And we Americans, we fight probably the same as you do, but to live under our Constitution, under the American Constitution, which grants all those liberties that I mentioned up at the beginning. And they, uh, the others on the panel, they, they kind of looked at me and they, they couldn't quite grasp, we've got to beat terrorism, we have, we have to fight terrorism. I'll keep trying. So, it's been a rough Ramadan. We're nearly to the end of it. Uh, it ends in just a few days. In that period of time, and I, I may not have even now uh, the complete up-to-date numbers, but in that time, the last I looked at the data, 200, well, not just, I should say, not just this Ramadan, but this goes back, the past uh, covers about two years worth. In that period of time, 277 Europeans have been killed on European soil, not in some overseas battlefield, but on European soil. Jihadis have attacked the parliament in Ottawa, Canada, cafes here in, or close by here in Copenhagen, the beach boardwalk in Nice, France, a social center in San Bernardino, California, in the United States, the metros and the airport in Brussels, Belgium, a concert in Manchester, England, a theater, a sports stadium, restaurants, and kosher market in Paris, a church in Rouen in France, where a priest was beheaded at the altar, a Christmas market in Berlin, a mall in Stockholm. I may not have gotten the entire list, but you get the idea. The enemy is not just the Islamic State over in what we used to call Iraq or Syria. It's here. It's here. Now maybe some of them are coming from over there, but too many have come to our places, to our countries, and they have not been demanded, has not been demanded of them that they assimilate, that they accept our laws, that they abjure, that they give up allegiance to any other law like Sharia. And I'm talking about the United States too. We still don't have these kinds of extreme vetting is what our President Donald Trump talked about during our recent presidential campaign. It's not in effect quite yet, needs to be. When those whose values, whose principles, whose first things principles are so different from our own are allowed to establish parallel societies, because that's what they are, and enclaves in which 
Sharia is the law, those places have effectively seceded from the sovereignty of the host country. I know that as long ago as about, let's see, 11 years ago, I think it was, 2006, the French government actually published online on the internet a list of over 500, they call them zones urbaines sensitives or something like sensible, uh, no-go zones with the addresses and the latitude, longitude, and, and the entire details about each place. They had admitted that in France, that long ago, they already had over 750 places where the local law of France did not prevail. That's insanity. And we cannot let that happen any more in our places, in our countries. The canon Andrew, uh, Andrew White, who is the Anglican Church Vicar of Baghdad, said, Christianity in Iraq is over. How about Christianity in Europe? In America? If it is no longer the faith of the continent, of the people of Europe, What's taken its place? Has anything taken its place? There are beautiful cathedrals and museums full of beautiful art, the most fabulous music ever created on the face of the earth. That's not happening anymore. Churches are being converted into mosques in the United States too. Now it doesn't mean that everyone has to be Christian or Jewish, but we do have to acknowledge that those first things principles I talked about at the beginning, they come from the Judeo-Christian foundation. I say that in the United States, we are of Athens and Rome and Greece, uh, and, and uh, Jerusalem, excuse me, Athens, Rome, and Jerusalem. We are of Athens because that is the place where the first city-states govern themselves, self-government. Also, Greece, ancient Greece, was the place of humanism and reason and logic and philosophy and so many other things that are the foundation of our Western civilization. Rome, at least in its Republican period, because that was the time when in Rome, administration, representation, not, not universal, of course, but those things governed the Republican Rome. And then Jerusalem, of course, because Jerusalem is the place where both Judaism and Christianity arose. Those are our traditions. Those are the places where our Western civilization were founded. Europe is the place where they blossomed. This is the place where they bloomed. And we in America are so very lucky that our founding fathers, George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and all of the rest, many of them were actually born European citizens before they founded our country. But they founded it with the traditions that I just spoke about that come from Europe. That is the legacy that went into the, the writing of our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. Those are the first things, principles we hold dear, but it came from Europe and Athens and Rome and Jerusalem. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to Europe but I think we also owe some loyalty and some standing together to defend what we mutually hold dear. Because if we don't, we will lose it. The battle for Europe and the battle for Western civilization is unfolding before our eyes. It is not at all certain to me 
who will win. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, do you want to stay here for some questions? Uh, yeah, we could do that. Okay, okay if, um, we'll have about a five, ten minutes uh, question and uh, answer period. If uh, anybody has any questions uh, for Claire, please speak up. Yes? Take that. Thanks. Yes, please. We didn't just save you, we saved ourselves. We did. Any uh, other questions in the back there? From the new Trump administration, what do I expect? Well, uh, we uh, are very hopeful. Um, I belong to a think tank and a, uh, a group of, of like-minded American citizens who consider ourselves uh, conservatives, and uh, we support our new president and, and hope very much that he is uh, going to change things. He's already begun to change quite a bit, um, not just domestically, which is sort of, you know, internal stuff um, on our economy and business and jobs and that kind of thing, which we care about a lot, uh, but internationally. Um, I think he has already begun to shake things up. Uh, I would name especially this recent trip that he took internationally. It was his first trip abroad as president when he went to uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and then he went to Israel, and then he went on to, to Europe for uh, meetings with NATO and the G7. And uh, I, will, I will speak in, in particular about his trip uh, to Riyadh because I think that's where he really um, shook things up a lot. and. Uh, I think you are seeing the results of that trip play out right now. Um, I think he was instrumental in bringing together the group, the alliance of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and other Gulf states in an alliance. Um, now I would say an alliance of a bunch of Sunni mob bosses because that, that's who they were, they're collected in Riyadh. But I don't know if he would appreciate this from me or not, but I think of Donald Trump standing up there as the capo de tutti capi. <laughs> and I think they knew it, I think they knew it. He is a guy who has built casinos in New Jersey and New York. He knows how to deal with mob bosses. But the point being here that he laid down some expectations um, and uh, those expectations I think are starting to play out in terms of demanding uh, you remember the speech there where he talked about drive them out drive them out of your places of worship he said drive them out of your communities and what he was talking about was uh, the uh, ideology they're not extremists by the way they're, they're not they're not radicals uh, they're straight up the middle, devout, practicing Muslims who uh, seek to enforce Sharia, Islamic law. And I think those to whom he was speaking understood that. The other thing about the Riyadh uh, speech and trip, I think, was to form an alliance um, against the encroaching, very aggressive Shiite crescent, as we call it, um, the expansion of uh, the jihadist regime in Tehran, uh, which literally uh, if you look at the map, is surrounding the Arabian Peninsula with terror proxy allies and regimes from Beirut to Baghdad to Damascus to Tehran itself, and then around, if you will, even to Yemen. So all of that is playing out, and um, I, I hope that his comments at the G7 and, and at NATO uh, serve to reassure uh, Europeans uh, and when he was talking tough because that's what he was doing he was talking tough about the necessity for NATO members to meet their obligations in terms of defense spending um, I think that was uh, pretty much 
um, you know, guys, we're in this together, but, you know, we all got to play our part. So I hope it was taken that way, um, not as some sort of repudiation of NATO or abandonment of NATO, not at all. It's not that at all. Uh, but rather, uh, come on, guys, you know, we've, we've, we've all got to pay our fair share. So I hope that answers what you're thinking about there. All right. Uh, for anyone who uh, has more questions, I've got a bunch of business cards with me with my contact info on, email, and so forth. And uh, if you think of questions later or would like to ask something afterwards, please ask me for a card and I'll be glad to share that with you. Thank you very much. And Claire, we'd uh, like to present you with this little souvenir. And thank you so much for uh, coming here and... Uh, <laughs> yes, this one is in English. The other one was in Danish. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Claire.